Good morning. Welcome to Trinity Lutheran Church. Uh, my name is Lindsay Milbrath, one of the elders. I'll just be starting off the service. Pastor is up in the balcony with his trumpet for a little bit. Uh, we do have communion this morning, so if you would uh, look at the communion statement toward the back of your bulletin in preparation for communion, that would be good. And uh, we do have, the, as is our tradition, the lighting of the Advent wreath. And so I would ask uh, Jean Pollock and Mary Brody to come forward at this time. The word Advent is from the Latin word for coming, and as such describes the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ into the flesh. Advent begins the church year because the church year begins with Jesus' earthly life began in the Old Testament prophecies of his incarnation. After Advent comes Christmas, which is about his birth, then Epiphany about his miracles and ministry, then Lent about his cavalry-bound mission, then Easter about his resurrection and the sending of the apostles and then Ascension 40 days after Easter and Pentecost with the sending of the Holy Spirit. The first half of the church year, December through June, highlights the life of Christ. And the second half, June through November, highlights the teachings of Christ. The parables and the miracles play a big part here. That's the church year in a nutshell, and it should reveal how Advent fits into the big picture. An Advent reading from the book of Jeremiah. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good word which I have spoken concerning the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch of David sprout, and he shall execute justice and righteousness on the earth. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. we pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you for your love for us. You came to us to rescue us. It was a costly journey. You executed justice and you revealed righteousness. You were the one executed and we became your righteousness. You saved us. We praise you for your first advent and pray that your second advent will come soon. May all people see your righteousness and trust in you alone. We pray in your strong name, Jesus. Amen.
We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of the altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seek his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for you, and for his sake he forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins. In the name of God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our psalm today is Psalm 80. We read it responsively. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. You have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in full measure. And our enemies laugh among themselves. The Lord be with you. The collect for today is on page four in your bulletin. We pray together. Let us pray. Direct us, O Lord, in all our doings with your most gracious favor, and further us with your continual help, that in all our works begun, continued, and ended in you, we may glorify your holy name and finally, by your mercy, obtain eternal salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated for our first reading. A reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 64, verses 1 through 9. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood, and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, and that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things that we did not look for, you came down. The mountains quaked at your presence. From of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No one has seen a God besides you who acts for those who wait for him. You meet him who joyfully works righteousness, those who remember you in your ways. Behold, you are angry and we sinned. In our sins we have been a long time, and shall we be saved? We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls upon your name, who rouses himself to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have made us melt in the hand of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, 
you are our father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Be not so terribly angry, O Lord, and remember not iniquity forever. Behold, please look, we are all your people. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. We rise for the verse of the day in our gospel reading. In your bulletin on page 4, at the bottom, you'll see today's verse from Mark chapter 11, verse 3. Please join with me as we read the verse together. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and we'll send it back here immediately. The Holy Gospel for the first Sunday in Advent is recorded in Mark chapter 11, beginning at the first verse. Glory Glory to you, o Lord. When they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and will send it back there immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. This is the gospel of our Lord. And we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. It's on page 5 in your bulletin. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance by the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, 
who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke with the Congress. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. And our sermon hymn is hymn number 334. We sing verses 1 through 4. O Lord, how shall I meet you? Grace to you and peace from God the Father, who is the Father of us all, and from Jesus Christ, the humble King of kings, whose blood set us free from a polluted heart, and from God the Holy Spirit, who has given us every gift we need from little donkeys to the deepest and most enduring and powerful spiritual gifts of forgiveness, life, and salvation that we might serve our king humbly as he served us. So if you took the opportunity to read the introduction in today's bulletin to this uh, worship, which is our first Sunday in Advent, you're beginning to understand, maybe you already knew the connection with the Palm Sunday reading and the beginning of Advent. Um, this particular reading is appropriate at the beginning of Advent. Really, in Advent, we look two directions, as you heard as we were relating the candle. We're looking back at the first Advent of Christ as he came humbly in the womb of a virgin. And we also look forward to the glorious return of our King in the clouds with glory 
And he will do at that time what Isaiah prays that he does in our Old Testament reading, that he will come down and rend the heavens. We will see him in his glory. Palm Sunday occurs between these two events. The turn the, between the conception of Christ by the Holy Spirit, the womb of Mary, and of course the return of Christ. And as I wrote those introductory notes, you'll notice that I said, at the time of this writing, I was hoping Christ would come before today, but he didn't. So you get today's sermon, which will be not as cool as Christ's coming. Jesus, the larger-than-life man riding upon the foal of a donkey. Um, we don't have that on our bulletin cover. The kids have it on their particular cover, and this one gets it right. If you see a lot of the depictions of Palm Sunday, they see Jesus and the donkey kind of full size. The artist obviously didn't read their Bible. So Jesus was awkwardly big on this donkey. And as we think about this big man, we realize that he is far bigger than what they can perceive. Uh, he is a king, but he is the king of kings. And the depiction really fits well. Um, this strange occurrence, this is a strange king. This king of kings is not doing what most people would do, send their armies to fight a war. He goes himself and fights the battle alone and defeats the enemy. In the opening hymn of today's service, you heard three verses that, maybe you sang the three verses, that are really seminal and focus in on this idea of Christ as humble king in a beautiful way. Verses 2, 3, and 4 are what I'm focusing on. The everlasting Son incarnate deigns to be, himself a servant's form puts on to set his servants free. Beautiful verse. Verse 3. O Zion's daughter, rise to meet your lowly king. No, let your faithless heart despise the peace he comes to bring. That's the faith verse. How will we respond to the king? Verse 4, the second part of Advent, his return. As judge on clouds of light, he soon will come again, and his true members will all unite with him in heaven to reign. That is what we look forward to. So do you see a servant or do you see a king? Of course, there's one Christ riding on this donkey, both servant and king. He is both the present servant and king who serves us through his word and through the sacraments, and he continues to serve as king every time we acknowledge him as such in our life. So as we look at this reading from today, I actually think that we get this concept of Christ as king and servant in an unlikely place in verse 3. I'd like you to turn over your bulletin to the gospel reading for today, reading from Mark chapter 11, and we would uh, read this little verse which has big implications. Verse 3, and if you locate it, we will read it together. We read... If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and we'll send it back there immediately. So the New Testament Greek scholar James Veltz says this is actually not an easy verse to translate. And in his own commentary, he actually gives two different translations. Your translation today, taking that one phrase, the Lord has need of it, that was the ESV. The King James has, the Lord has need of him. And then the Professor Velt's translations are the first one, the Lord's has, that Lord has need of it. And the second one is different. Its Lord has a need for it. Interesting. Questions abound. Is Jesus describing himself as Lord, or is he describing the Lord God in a different way and referencing that his father needs it. Is Jesus describing the owner and steward of the donkey when he uses the word him, as Veltz did in his translation, it's the Lord's need for it, or the Lord has need of him. Is Jesus describing that he is the Lord of the donkey? The Lord has need of him, the him being the donkey. And possibly the biggest question, 
which is not really one of translation, but one of meaning, is why would Jesus need a donkey? So let's begin with the last question first. Why would God say that he needs a donkey if Jesus is the Lord Christ? What is the purpose of a donkey? Some commentators point out that if you read Jesus and even you know, the beautiful Christmas cards that you're going to be sending out with the, the picture of Mary on the donkey, well, that's not really in the text. They, she may have very well ride, ridden a donkey, but you know, Jesus didn't ride donkeys. Jesus walked everywhere. There's no other episode in his ministry where Jesus apparently needs a donkey. And after all, I mean, he's riding downhill. The Mount of Olives is taller than Mount Zion, where Jerusalem is located with the temple. And so it's a downhill journey. He's not getting tired. So when we think about the questions, why would he need a donkey? Why would he need a donkey that's small when he could have ridden on the big donkey? And riding downhill didn't mean that he needed an animal to transport him. And what God is really saying is that Jesus is doing something epic and different, something new, in fact, entirely new, which is why he emphasizes that the donkey had never been ridden before. This is not only a new thing for the donkey, but it's a new thing for these people. They have never seen anything like this, nor have his disciples. This is a big thing that Jesus is doing on a small animal. So Jesus, in the midst of a festival, this is the beginning of the Passover week on Palm Sunday. Thousands of people have emerged in Jerusalem, and they have all brought along with them, most of them, a lamb for sacrifice on Passover that they will later consume, which is, of course, why Jesus instituted Holy Communion on the Passover. He is the Lamb of God that takes away our sin. So this is just a loaded and epic event. And Jesus draws attention to himself. Let none of your unbelieving friends say Jesus never said he was the Messiah. He said it in a lot of ways, including bring me this little donkey. So as you think about how epic this event was, when thousands of people are bringing their lambs, all to be inspected, by the way, on Palm Sunday. That was the day when they inspected lambs. Did they pass muster or not? Could they be an acceptable sacrifice or not? Jesus, the Lamb of God, is riding down on the foal of a donkey, and they are saying, Hosanna, which means God save us. So this is seen by the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the elders, those guys who basically live in the temple or teach in the synagogues. They know the word of Christ. They know the Old Testament. And they know that this particular episode is a loaded and meaningful event Jesus is claiming to be the Messiah. Now, many of you who worship on Palm Sunday or have worshiped on a Sunday when we read from Zechariah 9 know the verse that's coming. This is the verse. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just. He is victorious. He is endowed with salvation. He is humble and mounted on a donkey, even a colt, the foal of a donkey. This quote is found in the second to last book of the Old Testament, kind of looking forward to when this prophecy will be fulfilled. And you know, there are prophecies that are like laser focus. This is a laser-focused prophecy. You cannot mistake that this prophecy is fulfilled at this particular moment in time. Such prophecies include, in a more general way, that the Messiah would be the son of David. He would be from the tribe of Judah. Oh, here's a laser prophecy that he'd be born of a virgin. And he would be born in the village of Bethlehem, not just the other village of Bethlehem. There were two. It's a laser focus. Bethlehem Ephrathah, the one right outside of Jerusalem, the town of David. He would be Emmanuel. This isn't going to be any baby. This is going to be God with us, which is what that means. He will have his hands and feet pierced. More laser prophecies also from Zechariah. He will be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Yeah, even the amount is there. Don't miss it. 
It's a laser focus. And he's not riding like other kings on a horse or in a chariot or even on a mule. He's riding on a donkey, even the foal of a donkey. Jesus is saying, I am the expected king, and I'm filled with salvation, and I'm here for you. Jesus wanted the people to get it, and I think they got it in part. They did quote from that beautiful Psalm 118 that's quoted over and over again in at least 20 different festivals in the, in the year of the Jews, they would be singing Psalm 118, which include Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. So Jesus really did need that donkey. He needed it because it was going to be the fulfillment of God's word, and you know that God's word cannot be broken. Jesus needed it because he was full of salvation, and salvation spills out in a lot of different ways, including a visual sign of humility. Your king is going to save in a humble way. He's not going to snap his fingers and say, your sins are taken care of, but he's going to say, the soul that sinneth shall die, and I will be that soul. Jesus is coming to save us in a way that other people cannot save. There's something else about this particular reading today in Mark that I think is important, and maybe you picked it up as the reading was read. Dr. Veltz says that the voice of Mark's gospel changes in chapter 11, and he goes into what he calls the historical present. He said it makes the events vivid to the reader. In other words, we're suddenly there. And as you hear the reading from Mark 11, if you're there watching this unfold, how do you watch it? Do you see it with the scoffing eyes of the religious leaders who get angry at Jesus and despite the fact that they know this verse and they know how could you orchestrate this? They hate him for it. They resent him. They resist him. They refuse to believe the truth that they know. A lot of people look at Jesus that way. Do you look at it like the disciples who are just puzzled by this thing, but they, they still follow through? Jesus gives them a command to go find this donkey, and by the way, he knows where it will be, and he knows all about its path. That's kind of intimidating if you don't know Christ as Savior. Do you see it like the crowds? We see it from the perspective of Psalm 118, where the psalmist says, the stone will be rejected and it will become the chief cornerstone. That's also in that psalm. The people knew that psalm. They sang that psalm. It was in their memory banks. There was something special about this. And although they didn't fully understand Jesus, they wanted to be associated with him. And there are many Christians who just know enough about Jesus to know that he saves me. But as they grow in that association, they learn more and more about Christ and grow in their life as faithful servants and stewards. Jesus is about to save them in a way that they have never been saved before. On the day of Passover, when the Passover lambs were sacrificed, how could you orchestrate that? Only God can. It was the highest salvation, the salvation God had been talking about since the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve saw the results of their sin, when the animal that they named was killed, and they got to wear its robes to cover their shame. Sounds like baptism. Read Galatians 3. We will be saved in the highest salvation when we believe in Christ, and even that is a gift. St. Paul wrote in this beautiful passage opening up 1 Corinthians, and if you read 1 Corinthians, you realize that that is a dysfunctional congregation filled with public and private sinners, and Paul says this to them, so that you are not lacking any gift, waiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. A faithful disciple sees this and just knows he's my savior. I don't get all the other stuff, but I know that if I trust him, 
I will stand with him and be blameless when the day he returns to judge the earth. Paul talks about a grace given. It's God's gift. He wants to give it to you. Don't push the gift away. But there is one more aspect of growth I want to leave you with. It is an aspect of a Christian who grows in their life and faith and stewardship. The Lord had need of him. Isn't that a curious phrase? I mean, does God really need anything at all? Apparently. He needed to do this, and he needs people to believe him. And so as this man watches these disciples come and take his little foal that, you know, has never done anything special except follow its mom around, you would wonder, is he going to give it away or not? And I want you to read that passage the way I think it's intended to be. The little lamb is the, the Lord's. It's his. Because the genitive is there. And the man who owned that little donkey is his. And God needs it right now. And you're going to get it back. But he needs you to step up and allow him to use the donkey that's his. See, this is a pretty potent stewardship. You may not think your gift is significant, whatever it may be like a little donkey, or a stable, or a manger, or even your minimal faithfulness as the same way I would describe mine. But God needs it. He created us to do good works, to show his glory. And the beautiful thing is, you don't really give it away. Jesus says, that you cast your bread on the waters, and in not many days it returns to you. That's just the way it works. Faithfulness never loses anything, it just gains. You know, even John 15, when Jesus says, he is the vine, we are the branches, we're pruned, but what happens to the area that's pruned? Suddenly new growth, new faithfulness, new fruit. You get back even more. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about faith. Trust God when he calls on you to be a faithful steward, as minimal as it may be, step forward and greater gifts will be given. Amen. We sing the hymn, and by the way, I need to correct the verse. Uh, the offertory hymn, Lord of All Good, hymn 786, will be verse 1. Good luck finding verse 4. Please stand and sing verse 1 of that hymn. At this time, we gather your prayers and offerings. There's an orange card in front of you. If you have a prayer request for the worship service, fill it out and give it to the children. Uh, if it's a private prayer request, the back side of that card is filled out and drop it in the basket as you leave today. You may be seated.
Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for your word. It is absolutely necessary to you that your word is fulfilled. And you have fulfilled all of those prophecies talking about our redemption. And in Christ, our sin died. And in Christ, a new life has arisen. We thank you, Lord, by the gift of faith you have enabled us to pass through death into life. We pray, Lord, that we too, as your stewards called from darkness to light, would reflect that light by giving whatever you are calling us to give, knowing that it's not really a gift. We're just being obedient to faith, standing up, delivering small or large, what we need to do to be your servants, to humbly serve our King. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So uh, I, I think this is a very good prayer. Uh, I remember going to church in college, especially at the end of a semester. Here's our prayer. For a successful final season for the college students. We will pray that they have focus and memory. Uh, for all the special programs and activities during this Advent and Christmas season, that they would glorify God and strengthen faith. And you will hear more about the special events coming up, uh, including our Advent worship, which begins this Wednesday. Um, I have on my heart and mind um, Kevin Dunn. Uh, Kevin, as some of you know from time to time, we pray for him. Uh, he has uh, either ALS or MMN. Um, and I have been unable to visit him for a variety of reasons up in Rochester. Um, and uh, I just... I, I think about him often and because he sits in bed unable to do anything except move his eyes. So let's, uh, let's pray for his strength. Let's rise. Lord Jesus Christ, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. You have given us astonishing gifts, physical, intellectual, and for those who have received Christ, spiritual gifts. We pray, Lord, that we would be faithful in all of those gifts. Be with our students, especially at every level, uh, as they prepare for the coming finals uh, of this semester. We pray, Lord, that you would give them focus, enable them to retain what they have learned and to understand it and to express it. Uh, we thank you for the gift of teachers, and we pray that you may bless them, that they would be skilled in what they do, and the students would then take this learning and be called as your servants to use it in this world in a way that pleases you. Lord, we struggle as a church and all churches to be faithful to you, reflecting what you want us to do, and so we do many things. In many and various ways, we try to serve you, uh, and we pray that in our worship, in our prayers, in our meditations, in our Bible studies, in our ringing and singing, that we would bring glory to you, uh, and that all of these efforts, especially in December, would bear abundant fruit. And Father, we pray for our brother in faith, Kevin Dunn. Um, we don't see Kevin because he is sustained by a respirator, um, and he has complete limitations of his body. Uh, all of us cannot appreciate what that would mean for us, but we do pray for our brother Kevin, and we thank you for his faith and pray that you would cultivate that faith and fan it into flame, that he would rest in Christ who is his Sabbath. Be merciful to him. And even now, Lord, we know that you can do all things and we commend his care and his body to you, praying that in your mercy, according to your will, you would restore him. In the name of Christ, we ask these things. Amen. <clears throat> we prepare to receive communion with the preface on page Four in your bulletin or 208 in your hymnal. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. <laughs> Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God. 
for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally, because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity. All who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment, you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your mercy, you promised salvation by a second Adam, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust him. We give thanks for the redemption that you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had supped and given thanks, he gave it to them, and he said, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. May the peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please rise as we sing the Nunc Dimittis. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith towards you and in fervent love towards one another through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. As I alluded to earlier, we have uh, Advent Wednesday services beginning this week, 7 o'clock p.m., um, and we are going to do a pulpit exchange with myself and the two LCMS pastors south of us, Pastor Keith and Pastor Bellinghausen. Um, and so that was only, it's a weird year for our schedule. We only have three Wednesday services, so um, that will be the successive Wednesdays. Um, also, um, just... <clears throat> One more thing I wanted to remind you that uh, in January, I have yet to determine the specific day of the week. It'll be some evening, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, starting sometime in January. We will begin uh, classes for uh, those who would like to take communion on a regular basis here or become communicant members. Um, so that will be, um, it's, a, it's a great class for anybody. You don't have to just want to do that. Good refresher, lots of good meat of God's word. Uh, if you're interested, please email the church about that. Other announcements we have? Lindsay? Anything? Well, you know, um, in this season, incredible season of hope and light, well, there's three things here. One, the Advent wreath. We lit the candle of hope today. Two, if you notice, it's brighter. Our sanctuary now has all broken and burned out lights repaired, a total of 19 bulbs. Oof, wow, wow. And last of all, next Saturday, the hanging of the greens, where we brighten the sanctuary even more, at 9 o'clock Saturday morning. Very good, and that's next, uh, the, the ninth is next Saturday. All right, Mary. And uh, I'll make the announcement for hope, but the after-school program, if you'd like to come, is this next Saturday, the 9th, the same day we do the greens in the afternoon, I believe at 4, right, Hope? So you're, you're all invited to see that. Kids have been working hard on that for after-school. It's a, it's a great ministry that we have for these kids. Mike Thompson. So for choir, it's been a slow uh, fall, but uh, after um, Advent services, we like to practice, so we do some music during the, the Christmas season. So right after the Advent service. All are welcome. <laughs> okay, and I see Lisa Cooper's hand up. I want to invite all of the Lutheran Student Fellowship um, attendees, students, um, and beyond to come to our house tonight for the last LSF of the semester. Thank you to Pastor Cooper and Lisa for opening up your home to the students. I see Ray and Vivian. Okay. Just a reminder, there's a few more 
more angels on the angel tree out front. Um, your children have made requests for Christmas for those who are in need. So please take an angel. Also, we are really short of ushers. If someone is, it would like to usher, and even if they don't want to. <laughs> The pay is a handshake. Uh, and I know my, my wife has, uh, there's an announcement in the bulletin, so uh, she uh, is responsible for the poinsettia. So there's a sign up sheet if you'd like to get a poinsettia. They will be costing you $8 to the church, uh, but it's pretty reasonable and you can take it home. Um, so please sign up if you want to have that done. No more announcements. Well, that's just a reflection of what's going on this time of year. So thank you all for all the work and support of those ministries. Let's go with the blessing of our Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. <laughs>